everyone good morning, good morning everyone ah that's better okay this is the first time i'm speaking at a conference in bangalore and glad to be here but before i get started just a quick uh, check on uh, you know what kind of backgrounds do all of you come from how many of you are working in some form of technology would you just raise your hands how many of you are playing a pure business role no technology out there and how many of you are working in analytics so technology and analytics for you is the same or similar right i see a lot of hands coming up there great so that's a nice point to be uh, so you know i have uh, 40 odd minutes to to speak today and uh, what i really want to spend some time uh, talking about is you know analytics often is is a lot like that old story about the blind man and the elephant right Uh, the many blind men and the elephant and everybody seems to have a different take on what constitutes analytics there could be someone who does a lot of good business intelligence and that's analytics someone who does a deep algorithm and that's analytics and someone from the business perspective also sees it as analytics so uh, you know often one of the things that that happens when you have an unclear definition is you do get into paralysis analysis is paralysis is an old statement that all of you would have heard and uh, from a business point of view if you're you know when you're working in business any form of paralysis is actually anathema you just don't want it and therefore that starts to become a problem uh, with with the function itself that are you over analyzing are you actually getting into a paralysis point so uh, so one of the things that that i have always believed is um, analytics is actually occupying an intersection set of skills so you need people who have technology backgrounds people who have deep business understanding and people who understand stats all coming together not necessarily that they have the same percentage of all these three together but the team which gets constituted needs to have all of this and when it when it's a question of bringing intersection skills together the challenge always is to understand each other's language so uh, i have a geek in my team who is not understood by the guy who is a campaign manager who needs to take action on the insight who is not understood by the business guy who does not understand the tool so how do you start improving communication in the case of a business or a function where without that communication the intersection does not happen is absolutely absolutely key and which is really what brings me to the point that if you do not want paralysis to happen you need as functional specialist to start telling stories about the data that you see which capture people's attention and and why that becomes particularly important is that one is the communication within your own teams but more importantly anything that you do in analytics has to go out there and make a difference to the business and if it has to make a difference to the business you have to hold their attention and that is where the concept of saying that how can we as the community of people who work with data with analytics whatever you might want to call it how can we become better storytellers and and actually enable the usage of analytics that much more so what i'm going to do is i'm going to spend some time talking about uh, a little bit of context uh, and that context is really more to to focus in on one aspect which is more marketing my own background is that i come from marketing for the last 20 years i was the cmo for hgfc bank till about 5 years ago and before that i was the cmo for a large retailer called shopper stop Uh, and and so therefore my focus has largely been marketing and over the last 5 years uh, i along with my partner swami we've set up a venture called sequity in partnership with a company called hansa so the first part of my presentation i will take about 15 minutes on that is really more setting the context about the marketing aspect and how analytics plays a role and and really what aspects one needs to cover there and then i want to take a small example of of how data can be used interestingly to tell a story and and then through that converge to say what kind of learnings in analytics should one carry forward into business and that's really what i want to cover so just starting out okay thanks yeah so just starting out i think uh, we heard in the earlier presentations about there been this whole tsunami of data lots and lots of data out there and uh, in my view uh, as we go along and as business grows i think uh, for years and years together businesses have seen brands as being very critical and brand equity for most businesses has been very very important i think in the days to come uh, data equity will occupy even a larger space in the minds of people within business and consumers as well 
and data equity, if used effectively, can translate to very powerful brand equity as well. And I'll talk a little about that. But how companies start to store, use, transform data can actually be a huge differentiator. We hear about this in a lot of case studies. Uh, how many of you have heard of a bank called Capital One? Right? How many of you have heard of a casino company called Harass Casino? Right? So at the same time, you know that there are only these four or five companies which have created compelling differentiated advantage by using data effectively. Right? So why is that? If, if, if data is going to become so important and there is data equity which is so critical, uh, why is it that for that to happen, you need to do more than just do the technical stuff on the data? And I'll touch upon that as I go along. But uh, the, the point really is that if that data is not powerfully used to differentiate for you as a consumer, your experience, when you walk into a store, when you walk into a branch, when you go to a travel company, if that difference is not felt by you as a consumer, that data is not worth its while. And over a period of time, that data will get eliminated by businesses if they aren't able to find ways to utilize that. So the final point that I'm making on this chart is to say that data equity, while it is going to get very, very critical, not many players, not every player, not every company will find ways to transform the data and take it to the point of experience. The, the point at which you as consumers, you and me as consumers, experience that company. And that, that is absolutely critical. So if I look at India, for example, you have more than 60% of GDP now coming from, from services businesses, so banks, retailers, and so on. And, and what that is doing, it's obviously creating far larger interactions for each of us with the retailers, with the banks, and that's producing data. So all of us are actually leaving footprints behind of data with each of these companies, which it is up to the company to analyze and get insight from. But that footprint is there. The other piece which is happening in India, again, is that uh, thanks to the growth of telecom and all of these businesses, a lot of us, in fact, more than 400 million people in this country, are today addressable. What I mean by addressable is you're on a database. You sit either in a bank's database or in a retail company's database or in a travel company's database or a telecom player's database. And when you, when you become addressable, we, you know, people as marketeers can start to interact with you and you aren't just an amorphous mass of consumers, right? So, so that's the other thing. And obviously, as this data starts to uh, embed itself within companies, there's the opportunity for companies to start having conversations with consumers. And one-to-one -one conversations, but at scale. And a lot of companies like Capital One, Haraz, have, have actually done that extremely well. And, and that's going to be really the future where companies start building those conversations. Uh, at the same time, and I touched upon this earlier when I said that there are not, they're not that many companies which are building that compelling advantage. So while the data is exploding, the execution gap of companies being able to utilize that data is, is creating a very large void. And then that gap really is largely about how do you create the downstream pieces of which analytics as a function is one part to enable people to take action on that data. So when I am a credit card holder and I, you know, and I get a call from the bank, you know, which, which actually says that, look, uh, have you just purchased something which is high value? If I walk into a jeweler's shop and I buy something of high value, how many of you have experienced this from a bank? Just a few? Right. So that's the that's example. Despite so many banks and, and almost 25 million credit cards in the country, just a few of you have experienced this, which could either mean that not a lot of you are using the cards for high value, but the other point really would be that not that many banks are connecting with you at the point when a high value transaction happens. But when a high value transaction happens and I've used my card and the bank calls me saying that, sir, have you used your card for this jewelry shop? What really is happening is that data equity through the transaction processing system is coming to me and I'm feeling a sense of comfort that this bank cares about the security of my card. So if you remember, earlier I spoke about how data equity can powerfully transform the experience and actually get brand equity at a notch above. That's an example of how that can happen. And then when you take this across to multiple businesses, multiple industries, uh, you, you have the potential to really, really impact business. And then how do you get companies to do this? Because in many businesses, this kind of stuff has happened because of the nature of the business. The banking and financial services business for years has done stuff like this. But how do you do that in consumer goods? If I go to a consumer, if I go to a grocery shop and I'm buying, I don't get a set of relevant offers for me. So, so that, that is the challenge which I think all of us as professionals have to work towards. So uh, just changing context a little bit, uh, you know, the, the question really is how do we as consumers take decisions? You know, more often than not, we use our instinct. 
yes, we might use data, we might go, our day jobs might be saying that data analytics, but in our personal life, we use a lot of intuition. And the other side, as our intuition sometimes misfires, we start to calculate, analyze, and do more of that. And that's how we start moving in that continuum towards being a little more analysis-based. Sorry, I'm having a problem with this. Okay. So, so the, the issue really is, as one starts to look at this kind of analysis, uh, the, the issue to my mind is that, is analytics really about the sexy insight that you can draw out from the data, that fantastic diapers and beer example which one hears about so much. Have, have all of you heard of this diapers and beer example? How many of you have heard? Yeah, okay. So, is it really about those sexy insights or is it about an effective decision? Is it about the fact that when I am at the store, I get something very relevant for me? I think banking and financial services have actually mastered that aspect. If you go and apply for a loan in a bank, the bank uses tremendous amounts of data and they actually are able to do a go, no go decision whether to give you a loan or not give you a loan, right? That's an example. Or if you take a credit card and depending on how you repay and how much you spend, your credit card limits would get enhanced. So banks have done that very well. But how often do you see this happening with other businesses? Not as much, right? And as, as, uh, as the competitive intensity starts to increase, as more and more companies need to start making very relevant propositions to consumers, what consumers are saying is that if you don't make a relevant proposition for me, I'm gone, I'm out of here. So you need to become relevant. So at one side, this is data, data tsunami, data glut. The other side, there is a huge competitive intensity which is changing the consumer, saying that, look, be more relevant for me. And that's the context in which really analytics is, is, is playing. And, and therefore, my view is that we're really talking about analytics in the context of saying, how do you take improved decisions? What is sexy about analytics is the decision-making capacity. And really, that's what we're trying to talk about as, uh, as the capacity for analytics. And when you look at this chart, you, in, in most companies, you, on the x-axis, you have a you know, lot of low-volume decisions which the, which the company might make. Someone walks in, you know, maybe once in three months, he has to be given or sold a product, that's a low volume decision. But someone calls up every day asking for something, that's a high volume point of interaction. And the other side, you have the value of that interaction. So in the, the high value, very low volume kind of situation could really be like a merger and acquisition situation, where again, you can use analytics. But in the case of consumer businesses, you have much more of these high volume and lower value interactions which happen with the business, everyday transactions. And how do you bring intelligence into that is, is absolutely key. The ability for businesses to go back and work on the technology stacks, connect up their big data, and connect that with rule engines and ability of powering the right algorithms to take the right decisions then becomes a huge, huge opportunity. So really what I'm saying is that effectively analytics needs to start by listening to the consumer because if you are, as a consumer, you don't want to be treated like a market segment. You know, uh, you, know you are not happy unless the marketer actually speaks to you as you, right? And how do you make that happen and how do you anticipate needs? Without, without doing that, you cannot expect that loyalty to happen, right? So that's the context within which uh, you're operating and if you don't do it, the consumer goes, right? So, so, so it is really not a choice that businesses have today uh, that because you're collecting so much data, let's start to use it. The context within which I'm talking about is that there really is not too much choice that if you don't use that data and if you don't start to listen far, far better and actually look at the footprints which your consumer is leaving behind, you are going to get left behind as a business. And to do that, most businesses and all of us have experienced this as consumers tend to you know, look at the product and say, hey, here is one offer which I want to sell to all of you, right? And so it's a mass rendition of an offer. How do you move from that paradigm to a paradigm where you have knowledge because of your data of a person with a change in behavior? Suddenly this customer who was never coming in earlier has come into my store today. That's a change in behavior. And now, how do I populate the right offer, the most relevant offer connected to the change in behavior? And that's the context in which analytics starts to work. And that's the context in which you can actually go back and justify uh, the ROI around using all of the technology required to, in, you know, to distill insight out of that big data. So, uh, you know, so, so if, if, if companies have to do that, uh, and if they have to really do that effectively, 
the biggest roadblock is what I call the silo elephant, right? So we are talking about the fifth elephant here in the conference. Uh, what is the silo elephant? The silo elephant is the problem that if you want to improve or change the way decisions are made within companies, you have to break silos. You have to be able to go and speak to the CFO and tell him why you are doing something in a certain way which is different from the past. You have to speak to, if you are a retailer, to the merchandising side. If you are a bank, you have to speak to your credit risk people. So, at the end of the day, however good you might be in the crunching of your data, if you don't start to tell stories, what happens is that you don't influence the decision makers. So, even before you can influence the kind of decisions you take for consumers, you have to influence people within your company and break the silos, right? And if you aren't able to do that, you aren't going to be able to influence. And, and the proposition very clearly, therefore, is that if you are an analyst sitting in the context of a big company or even from outside as a consultant, you have to find ways to be able to tell stories, to be able to make people change their mind. Now, what could this be about? This could be about, for example, if I'm a bank and I'm selling loans, uh, I would go and actually market my loans to everybody, but I have an internal base of customers to whom I might be able to sell loans far more profitably. But then for that, the sales channel has to think differently. I have to assemble data, make it rational enough for people to buy the argument. And, and that's the whole, uh, the whole aspect of uh, storytelling. And what's happening more and more is that India is a country, for example, with more than 60% 60 60 of the people being more, less than 27 years of age. So you have a younger and younger, uh, younger and younger consumer uh, profile. And in the business world, therefore, younger and younger people are obviously taking more and more decision-making positions. And, and what they are getting used to is consuming data in many ways. I think all of us today have so many apps which throw data back at us, and we are getting more comfortable with that, that people younger are actually far more comfortable with data than people older. Right? And as that change is happening, uh, storytelling with data will start to become even more critical and probably more naturally done by the younger people and, and will be critical from the point of view of uh, influencing change. So I wanted to uh, quickly take you through an example of, uh, uh, of a retail data set and very briefly tell you a little about that. I know that on a small uh, size over here that the data may not come out very well, so I'll speak a little more about it. But before I go into that, how many of you have heard of Hans Rosling? Right. How many of you have seen the, that 200 country presentation? Okay. So as, as I haven't got that many hands up, what I'm going to do is just switch a little bit. Sorry? Sorry, I'm just switching this a little bit. Uh, and before I start, just a background. So they say that um, if you have to tell stories with data, you need to have PhDs with personality, right? So how many PhDs with personality are there in this room? Okay, I'm not a PhD, so I don't want to make any judgment on PhDs with or without a personality. But the challenge always is that how do you get people to tell stories really, really well? And I wanted to show this video to you to tell you about a guy who I think is, is probably the world's best in storytelling. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry for the technical glitch. Yeah, so, so uh, while we are setting that up, so, so what happens when you are when you're doing this is that Remember, these stories that we are talking about are to be told on data which people are very familiar with. So, obviously, what I show you will be, uh, will be very sexy because it's completely consumer knowledge kind of information. But when you're doing this with, with, uh, with business data, obviously, the way you do it will be different, right? But, but the basic notion I want to leave behind with you is that unless you, unless you do that, you don't make that impact to be able to get people to start to swing their thinking to take decisions in a different way.
show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before. Animating the data in real space with a bit of technical assistance from the crew. So, here we go. First, an axis for help. Life expectancy. From 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth. Income per person. Four hundred, four thousand, and forty thousand dollars. So down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now I'm going to show you the world two hundred years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries: Europe, Brown, Asia, Red, Middle East, Green, Africa, South of Sahara, Blue, and the Americas, Yellow. And the size of the country bubble shows the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? Oh. Industrial revolution makes countries like so Europe and elsewhere. Sorry, I'll, I'll just switch. That's okay, we'll, we'll go without it. Okay, I'm sorry you couldn't, you could hear much of it, but uh, at least the point that I wanted to uh, make for all of you was that uh, that you really have someone out there who can tell stories very effectively and if you're able to leverage that skill within your own companies and, and get that kind of skill sets in your own teams, that'll be very, very useful. So just want to take you through a little bit of background. Uh, here is an example of a particular store or a particular retail business that, that, we, that we've done some work with. I've masked the data. But, um, you know, the challenge that you normally have in uh, uh, retail is the fact that, uh, you, you know, it's retail is a very catchment-led business. So consumers come in from uh, neighboring catchments. So if you're living within five to eight kilometers of a store, you would, you would come in and use that store. So in this case, for example, we, we took three years of data and we tried to put that in to try and see what sense can we make from it? What kind of business decisions can we make from it? So I just want to quickly take you through some of that. So, so in this case, for example, we, we, we tried to map the data and we said that on the y-axis, we have the number of loyalty members that this business had. And on the x-axis, we, we saw their, uh, the performance across month and then how did these customers do per each month going in from 2009. So when we did that, when we did that, what we, what we tried to look at was that month on month, is there a pin code which is kind of really, really differentiated? Are there some pin codes which are screaming out more than others? And, you know, appropriately, one particular pin code, which you can see right on the top, uh, which is that it not only got more members, it also got much more sale, started jumping out. And when we started to see that, when we started to see that, we said, okay, what is that PIN code? And we, we focused in on that PIN code. And as expected, because intuitively retail business does come from neighboring areas, there was a PIN code around the store. So when we did that, when we looked at that PIN code, we said, okay, so this is a PIN code which seems to be taking the lead. How, can, how good are you as a retailer in knowing that PIN code? Do you really have information about that PIN code? Do you really know what your store members are doing? How much they are really using your store? Are they shopping the full width? And things like that. So when we started to do that, we, we looked at this, this PIN code much more in depth. And we said, how is this PIN code doing? So when we started looking at that, we found that there seems to be a steady increase in, in, in business. So you know, there was a continuous increase till around September. And then suddenly from that point, there was some stability and there was a spike. So we were able to focus on two months where they seem to have been in September and October, a sudden spike in business and, and the amount of business done per customer seemed to have suddenly changed. So we went back to the store with this three years of data and we said that if you've looked at this, this whole movement of data, and if you really looked at this movement carefully, what, what you find, just to take you through that in a summary, is that a lot of people came from the target, from the target 40064, which was the pin code which jumped out. But a large number of people came from 10 kilometers away. 
which in terms of the Mumbai uh, map, which 10 kilometers away was actually one hour, 15 minutes away in time. So what this, what this meant was that the retailer could then think about location strategy in many more interesting ways, right? So the reason I'm giving this because uh, the only point I'm wanting to make with this data is to say that now you could start getting even more interesting facts together. You could pick up locations of all competing stores, populate them, look at data which you might have from other external sources, bring that in. And we did all of that. So while I don't have all of that story, what we were able to do as we assembled this data is that when we got into a room with their decision maker who wanted to take decisions around where to, where to have those stores, we were compelling. We were able to tell him that, look, here are these three areas which make much more sense than others, right? So I think the point I wanted to really make was uh, that, that, you really can, that you really can make a huge difference when you look at data, find insights, but focus a large amount of your time in, in distilling the value or the storytelling value which can help take decisions, right? So that's the point which I really want to talk about and, you know, uh, I've gone through this like an express train, but I will continue at the same pace. I think uh, if there are any questions in between, I, I'm happy to take them right now. Yeah, we can take questions. Yeah. So while I'm speaking, I'm, I'm okay. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them right now. Anyone? Okay, so, so you, you know, if you remember what I said, Let's just repeat the question. Yeah. Uh, the question was that what do you mean by data equity? So you have uh, data which, uh, which is there in the company and that data is about the customer and let's say it's a bank and I'm the customer and uh, let's say you're a customer and let's say you're Bill Gates. Okay, so uh, I'm me and you're Bill Gates and we both have a savings account and uh, if, if, if 300,000 rupees come into my account, uh, what do you think? Would that be significant? It would be, right? So for me, it is significant. If 300,000 rupees come into my account, it's significant. But remember, you are Bill Gates. If 300,000 rupees come into your account, is that significant? No, right? So now, the bank has the data to say that the same 300,000 rupees which are for me are significant should now have a decision which says that some relation manager calls me saying, would you like to invest in insurance? So what has happened is that your data, which is my data and your data, has allowed the bank to make an effective communication to me and, and tell me to do something which was very specific and which made a difference in my life. Or if I walked into a retail store and when I'm in the store, while I'm buying at the checkout point, if I was told that you're buying so-and-so, but because you always buy so-and-so, here is a special offer for you. Again, that's, uh, that's bringing the data right at the front end. So as you start to see this from a company repeatedly, you start to see equity. You start to say, hey, look, this, this makes sense to me. And you start slotting that company as a company which relates to you, which understands you. Finally, what are we doing through brand building? By building brand equity. That's what you're trying to do. That's what I mean by data equity being more powerful. Yeah. Any other questions? When you're doing a prediction, how much weightage do you give for your historical data? For? Your historical data. Historical data? Uh, when you want to predict your sales. Right. Uh, how much weightage you give? Yeah, or so uh, uh, what all metrics do you consider? Yeah, so if it's a forecasting problem like predicting sales, then you need to cover much longer you know, time periods because you will also have seasonality and so on. Because you might have a business which is seasonal, so you might have to cover uh, certain amount of seasonality elements for you to be able to forecast. So you would look at historical data going back to at least maybe at least two to three years to be able to make a prediction. But if you're looking at predicting uh, what this person might buy, you can work with very recent data. And fairly decent predictions can happen with fairly recent data. And, and that can allow you to take this as well. Yeah, I'll repeat the question if you just say it. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sort of. Okay. Uh, my question is, um, so you know, when you're faced with a large volume of data and you want to tell a story out of it, it's such an open-ended problem and it's really 
you can do tons of analysis on any set of data. Right. So uh, w what's the process that you use to actually look right. for the story? Yeah, so the, the process essentially is what we call POV. So essentially, as an analyst, you need to have a point of view. So let's say this big data that you have is about, let's say, a, you know, a business where uh, the business is not doing well. You need to have a lot of hypotheses, a lot of points of view, uh, which, which, which you allow uh, to be tested. And if you don't go in, if you expect the data to talk to you without that, it doesn't happen. You need to have very, very aggressive points of view. And that is where, again, I'll repeat that the intersection skill, skill, skill sets are very, very important. Because people, when they come with different backgrounds, you know, uh, make a huge impact in terms of being able to produce those points of view. And those points of view are very intuitive points of view, not basis data. And then you test those points of view out and a story comes out. Uh, so that's the first thing that you would always do. Have a very, very aggressive point of view. I don't know if uh, this is a good question to ask in this context, but if I were to think of this in purely in the case of an uh, online scenario, how would you deal with noise? Right. Because uh, the example that you gave, the amount of noise there is relatively very low. Right. You're dealing with transactions that have happened. But in the case of, uh, say, a purely online business, the amount of noise is very high. So how would you filter out noise? Yeah. So, see, I think uh, while the noise is very high, you also, uh, as against a retail store or online retailer, uh, can very, very constantly experiment. So, uh, so if you are, if you are really, I think, uh, possibly the paradigm of how you do analytics will will be very different, and and you might have to go in with a lot more experimentation, and and take the results of that experimentation. And yes, there will be noise, and there are techniques to be able to help you with trying to sort the noise problem out. But I think by by continuously experimenting with what the consumer is doing and picking up and building on that experimenta experimentation data and then coming out with the next step is, is, is the only way to do it in, in situations which are, which are online. I'm sure, you know, I'm sure you're doing that kind of stuff, but uh, that would be the way I would approach it. So test and control, design of experiments, you know, doing a kind of a factorial design setup and then you know, making sure you, you create a lot of options for consumers to look at and then see what works and that what you see is through data so build a protocol for testing uh, which is which is scientifically built and let that data talk to you more uh, and engage you far more anyone yeah. else hi uh, what do you think that, uh, I mean, once I've told a story about a data, right? So what is the success criteria for a story? So I think the success criteria for a story is that you have been able to take the decision that your analytics told you is the right decision. So if you said that, uh, uh, you know, that if you looked at uh, uh, replenishment in a retail store and you felt that you need to change the way you replenish certain stock and you did some analytics to be able to figure out what should be done in the supply chain. Now, your story needs to therefore connect to that decision. And, and therefore, it's not necessarily only one story. It's probably a sequence of stories because there are many stakeholders you need to tell stories to, right? So I was using the metaphor of story just to say that, look, these are conversations you have with multiple decision, decision influencers with which you finally, but finally, the, the decision which analytics tells you you must take, if that is not happening, you may have a great story with lovely insight and no decision, that's like operation successful patient aid. Yeah. How do how do you decide like uh, what is the yeah? How do you decide what should be the granularity of data when you're, you know, when you're modeling? Sometimes we can tend to over parameterize the things. Right. So you know, when you're modeling a real life problem, what is the essentially? How do you decide? Okay, these parameters be right. matters. This doesn't, and you can can you over parameterize? How do you that when is. you say over parameterize, you mean uh, width um, of uh, very deep data or? Yeah. Sorry. So, so lots of data. Yeah. So basically, in a retail store example, I mean, right. we tend to connect with, let's say, mm, is there any correlation between weather and the footfall? Sure. You know, sure. Say, sh now should sure. that come into the picture yeah. or not? Yeah. yeah. So I think as a general principle, obviously, the wider the data that is that you have is good. But I think it's my belief that if your data is not setting on hypothesis, uh, it tends to lose business context. Because again, when it comes to, you might say weather is very indicative, 
right? But weather may may have other dimensions that play into you know into the into the into the data. And for example, traffic may get worse with weather and the noise starts to increase. So I think intuitively you have to look at the width of data and say that will I be able to take a decision basis that kind of data and actually ruthlessly take out the data which is not supportable from the point of view of decision making. You know, that's one. Second, I think uh, the more the data within the hypothesis that you have, the better. The deeper that it is, the better. But I think you need to figure out how recent is your data and it's the recency factor which matters, matters much more. So I would look at uh, customer behavior as changes and whatever data helps me spot that changes, that's good for me. And then don't get locked into too long history longitudinally. That's the way I would look. Okay. There are many incidentally points of view on this and multiple people have different ways. That's, that's the way I tend to look at it. Just one last question. Uh, I am a statistician actually. Yeah. And uh, I have a lot of problem over how to, uh, I, I can do the analysis maybe, but I'm not able to tell the story. Right. Because I am more uh, obsessed or I am more thinking about the assumptions and all that that get into the modeling. So how do I present my story with the underlying assumptions that I made for analyzing the data? Yeah, so I think see as a, as a statistician you are uh, you know obviously much more focused on the technique and the stats behind it, right? But, but I think there are a lot of insights that a statistics is taking out. And if you, if you try to say that, you know, I mean, one good example which I use and I have frankly failed on that a lot, but I have a 15 year old daughter and every so often when I have an important presentation, I run a few slides through with her and she says that's garbage. I didn't understand a word of what you have said. And so to me, intuitive commonsensical words and intuitive business explanations are far more important than saying that, uh, you know, that KS factor is not right or, you know, the business guy doesn't understand it. So if you want to say KS factor is a problem, uh, can you give an example of separation uh, in a room which has some people who are black and some people who are white? You know, so I, can you try to work at trying to find uh, business oriented, people oriented, intuitive explanations for a lot of statistical phenomena? And then there are a lot of stuff on the, on the, on the net which will help you on that, uh, you know, and, and you, you should look at that. But simplification and business oriented language is what, is what helps. I just want to wrap up with just a few thoughts. Uh, so, so one, basically with this whole data-led marketing, an interesting uh, conclusion that, uh, that Gartner has is that in the, by 2017, they say the chief marketing officers will spend more on IT than uh, CIOs. So uh, to that extent, obviously with digital, with web, with consumers leaving so much data, there's going to be a movement towards marketing consuming that much more data. And, and obviously, uh, as, you, as more and more consumers start to engage with with businesses on mobile and on the internet, you start getting a lot of pull behavior, which is basically that, uh, you know, I'm trying to download something. So that's a lot of interaction behavior. And as you start to understand that interaction behavior, it gives you a lot of information about how customers are changing. And that, that is going to become very important. And, and I gave you these examples about the jewelry, the, the jewelry purchase in a, in a credit card situation. I call those events and those are really event triggered examples. And there are a lot of such events. The Bill Gates example was also an event, right? So how do you powerfully use customer behavior changes to spot events and then drive, drive business around that? And, and therefore link, and all of the work that you guys do in analytics, link it to the last mile, to where the consumer is touching your business and see what impact you can make in that. And finally, I want to leave you with the thought that analytics, the reason why storytelling becomes so important is that analytics finally has to solve a social problem. It's not solving a technical problem. The logistic regression methodology algorithm was done 45 years ago. We still use it for cross-sell. Okay? We are solving social problems. And if you go back and look at the intersection skill sets required to build this solution using storytelling, I think there is a long way this can take you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay.